All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do so yet, please introduce yourself um, in the chat box. Let us know who you're with, where you're dialing in from. Uh, before I start off with introductions, I do want to hand it over to Angie for a little bit of housekeeping. Thanks, Catherine. Just wanted to let everyone know today's program does have continuing continuing education available for nurses, social workers, and counselors. It is worth 1.5 continuing education credits. Opus Peace will be sending out the exam as well as the evaluation. After those are completed, you will receive the certificate via email. So you must complete both the evaluation and the exam within two weeks of today's program. If you have any questions, you can certainly contact me directly. My Email is on the screen and will also be in the chat. And just a reminder that if you're watching in a group, we do need to know that you're on the call. So if you haven't registered and you're watching in a group, if you would please put that information in the chat so we're sure to have your email and we can email you the information that you need. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks so much, Angie. Um, okay, just a few quick reminders. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we will be posting it on the We Honor Veterans website following the webinar. Please note, we will not be sharing slides as they are available within the recording. And as Angie mentioned, if you have any questions about continuing education credits, please reach out to her. Um, I do want to go ahead and get us started. Make sure we have about 15 minutes at the end for a question and answer section. Um, I'm very, very thankful to introduce a dear friend and colleague, Deborah Grassman, the founder of Opus Peace. Few people have been with 10,000 dying veterans. One VA hospice nurse has. What Deborah Grassman has witnessed is providing lessons for the rest of the world. The lessons are about a process for attaining personal peace, and ironically, these lessons have come from people who were trained for war. She discovered a phenomenon that has become identified as soul injury. As a result, she founded a nonprofit organization called Opus Peace to bring the soul injury message to others. A psychiatric nurse practitioner, Deborah has often has been the author of two books, countless articles, um, but her two books, Peace at Last and The Hero Within. She is a contributing author of four textbooks, has 25 published articles, and there are five documentary films featuring her work, as well as providing a TED Talk on soul injury. Deborah is the director of the Opus Peace Institute, where leaders are trained to provide programs that respond to soul injuries. So without further ado, we'll get started. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, NHPCO, for recognizing the importance of soul injury and also how to recognize and respond to it. And today we're going to examine one of the causes of soul injury, and that is unforgiven guilt, and shame. Before I do that, however, I'm going to just give you a glimpse of the history of soul injury and the nonprofit Opus Peace that's bringing the message about soul injury to the world. So watch this news clip and you'll understand the basis for what we're going to be talking about today. You're watching Fox 13 and the 10 o'clock news starts now. And it's a time to acknowledge our nation's brave for serving our country and protecting our freedoms. Oh, yes. And survivors of war can face wounds that you, you can't see. And they last for decades. An organization is bringing awareness and healing to these soul injuries. Surviving battle comes with its own cost. Another step. Nice. The physical toll of war can last a lifetime. And just like you, my soul has been injured by military service. And so can the emotional. This is an opportunity to heal the wounds that your soul may be still carrying. This is the hard part. During a ceremony in Tampa, veterans and families of veterans are taking what may be their first step in facing a soul injury. How do we decide who we would see and who we did not with only 20 beds? That I've been rehearsing 
his funeral for eight years. Soul injury is any time we get separated from our real self. And often how that occurs is from unmourned loss and unforgiven guilt and shame. Deborah Grassman is the founder of Opus Peace. We gather together to experience personal healing. A nonprofit organization that provides educational programs like this one about soul injury. It was something she discovered while caring for dying veterans as a hospice nurse. Often what I would see at the end of life is these memories, these guilts that would surface unbidden on their deathbeds. Grassman wrote about those experiences in her book called Peace at Last. Decided to dig myself in. It spoke to Army veteran Buzz, who suffered his own soul injury. After coming across the remains of a German soldier during World War II. <laughs> his, his helmet was still on the ground. His rifle was disassembled, uh, apparently an American soldier, and our troops were in that area prior to that, apparently came upon, upon him and uh, didn't give him a chance to surrender or anything, and he shot him right on the top of the head. <laughs> that unnerved me, to say the least, and I had a job to do, so I took the helmet home with me. And for about 75 years, I never told a soul. But that changed after he read Grassman's book. That's when he felt released. And then he came and, and gave me the helmet. I thought, holy cow, I can get rid of this and relieve myself of all the pain I've carried. Great to see you. Now Buzz is following in Grassman's footsteps, volunteering at a hospice for veterans in hopes of giving them peace in their final days. My job is to get them to talk because they want to talk to a veteran. Soul injury can also apply to the families of veterans. I know that he experienced some trauma although he did not speak of it. What I would say to family members is, let yourself grieve the loss of that person, because you're right, he or she is never going to be the way he or she used to be. Grasman says it's not just the bravery of veterans that the country needs to recognize, but also their burden. We wave the flags, do all the patriotic stuff, and that's important. Acknowledge them now, that's important that it's not enough. What's more than that that they need is to acknowledge the losses that they have sustained and to teach them and show them how to grieve and also to learn how to forgive, especially forgive themselves. Grassman says soul injury extends beyond veterans. It could also apply to victims of assault or abuse. So you saw in that news clip about soul injury how that element of forgiveness often surfaces for veterans. Now today we're going to talk about forgiveness with veterans, but we're also going to talk about forgiveness for all of us. So I want to start by giving you just a brief overview of soul injury so you can see how all of this fits together. Now, you already heard the definition, which is a wound to our real self, the self beyond the facade. It's a wound that stifles full potential because it separates us from who we are meant to be. So think about your own life. Have there been times in your life when you felt lost, forgot who you really were? I know I've experienced that. I remember a time when I was feeling overwhelmed and depressed with the changes that were happening in my life. It felt like someone had opened the drain and all my passion was seeping out and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Well, one morning I was brushing my teeth and looking in the mirror. Only this time I looked beyond the eyes that were peering back at me. I was looking for my soul and what greeted me was nothing, emptiness. And I said out loud that day, Deborah, I don't know where you are, 
but I'm promising you right now that I won't stop until I find you. Now, I didn't have a name for what I was experiencing that day, but now I do. Soul injury. Now, soul injuries often surround the fear of not being good enough or smart enough or good looking enough or whatever the enoughness is. Feeling less than is often how a soul injury is acquired. Now, at Opus Peace, we're not using this term soul in a religious way. We use it as it's commonly used in everyday language, you know, soul mate, soul food, deep in my soul. Our definition of soul as we are using it is the part of you that's always urging you toward wholeness. What I know about the soul is that in silent moments, your soul whispers its presence. At night, when your conscious mind goes to sleep, your unconscious mind becomes awake with soulful dreams that can intuitively guide you. As you age, and especially as death draws near, the conscious mind recedes and the unconscious mind expands. And so your soul appears in unexpected moments as you are dying. That's what I know about soul. Well, let's move into soul injury. Now, sometimes people confuse soul injury with PTSD or with moral injury. Well, let's talk about that. Soul injuries can occur in the aftermath of trauma, but only if the trauma separates that person from their own sense of self. So let me give you an example. Linda Tricasser is one of our Opus Peace ambassadors. And when Linda was five years old, she was playing on the swings while her mother mowed the yard. Just as the lawnmower came close, Linda fell out of the swing and the lawnmower ran over her hand, severing three of her fingers. Linda was rushed to the hospital, but her fingers were unable to be restored. I think we'd all agree that that was traumatic. Now, did Linda develop PTSD after that trauma? She says she did not. Was there a moral injury committed? No, there was no moral injury. Was there a soul injury? Linda would tell you, yes, and here's why. Linda says her mother became so hysterical that when they went to the ER, the doctors first had to medicate her mother to calm her down before they could treat Linda. The result? Linda felt responsible for upsetting her mother. Five-year-old Linda thought it was her fault that her mother became so hysterical. So you see Linda's disfigured hand Linda says that her irrational guilt created an intense desire to prove to everyone that she could do anything that everyone else could do. So she learned how to play the piano. She learned how to type so that no one needed to feel sorry for her. Therefore, her mother need not feel guilty about anything or be upset about anything. Now, Linda says that as an adult, her stoic facade led to pervasive codependent behaviors in which she took on the role of caretaker for her family, for her friends, her coworkers, and she says even strangers if she could. And finally, and most importantly, she says this, my people pleasing behaviors became deadly to my soul. I was so busy taking care of everyone else that I arrived at a point where I had no me left. So that is soul injury. And you can see that it is very different than PTSD, very different from moral injury. And one of the main ways that soul injury is different is that its causes are different. Now, what are the causes of soul injury? Well, primarily three things. Unmourned, 
loss and hurt, unforgiven, guilt and shame, and fear of helplessness and loss of control. Now today we're gonna to talk about guilt, shame, and forgiveness. Opus Peace has created a film about forgiveness and we're going to show you some excerpts from that film. But before we do that, let's look at a definition of forgiveness that Opus Peace uses. Oprah offers a definition of forgiveness that unearthed everything that I thought I knew about the subject. On her TV show, she says that forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past can be any different than what it was. Now, when I first saw this definition, I kept repeating it in my mind, giving up the hope that the past could be any different than what it was. And I resisted it. Then I started arguing with it. I mean, giving up hope? You can't give up hope. The more I argued, however, the more convinced I became that I was wrong. And I started to realize that living this definition allows us to move out of illusions and denials about our past. So you can see that forgiveness starts at home with ourselves. We have to make peace with all the scattered pieces of self, especially the parts of self that we hide in our shadow. Now I'm going to show you a film clip that talks about that. Ralph Raul Osmond is one of our Opus Peace ambassadors. He is a Navy veteran. Let's listen to what he has to say about his experience of guilt, shame, and forgiveness. But first, I want to talk to you about the important distinction between shame and guilt. These two terms sometimes are used interchangeably, and they should not. Shame tells us that we are wrong. Guilt tells us that something we did was wrong. And aren't these two very different things? We use shame to beat ourselves up and punish ourselves for what we did or did not do. Whereas guilt gives us feedback for learning how to do it differently so we can grow into our larger self. Shame keeps us stuck and immobilized, whereas guilt should actually move us into acting differently. Shame is one of the primary causes of soul injury because shame tells us that something is wrong with us. Shame disconnects us from our true self. Let me tell you how that happened to me. I grew up in a loving family, but when I was a child, my mother developed polio that rendered her helpless in many ways throughout her lifetime. She covered up her helplessness by becoming overly controlling, and our household was run in a regimented style, which interfered with my more carefree nature. So at a young age, I made a decision to conform to the regimen on the outside but keep my true feelings to myself. I created a secret identity. I was Ralphie to my parents, but I became Raoul to myself. Here's a picture of me in the second grade. This is Ralphie. This is a picture of me in the fourth grade. This is Raoul. Ralphie lived a boring life. Raoul lived an exciting life. While Ralphie was playing with his bat and ball, Raul was hitting a grand slam in the bottom of the ninth for the team win. Having this secret identity seemed so innocent until the day when Ralphie was out on his paper route and Raul noticed the above ground fuel tank for the county road equipment and started playing with the hose, fueling up his high powered race car. Who knew that when Raul accidentally locked the nozzle, fuel would spill all over the ground and drain the tank? Ralphie panicked and ran away. What I haven't told you yet 
is that Ralphie's dad owned the local gas station and had just filled up the tank that day. Imagine his surprise when he received a phone call telling about a vandal that had drained his fuel tank. It didn't take long to find the culprit. It took me all summer mowing grass, plus my paper route to pay for Raul's escapade. Still, Raul was my constant companion, and of course created more mischief. After one incident, I remember my dad saying to me, you never say you're sorry. And I remembered thinking, why should I say I'm sorry? I paid it back. I got the spanking. Everything's even Steven. Well, I continued hiding my true feelings through college, through my time in the Navy, and on into adult life. By this time, I had been hiding myself for so long, I had hid myself from me. I had developed a soul injury. I became whoever I thought someone wanted me to be. And as a result, all of my relationships ended in disaster. My fortune changed when I met my wife because she loved me for something she saw in me that I could not see myself. However, it has been through the work of Opus Peace, specifically the lessons of forgiveness, that I have been able to cultivate the characteristics of honesty to get real with myself, to summon the courage to say I was wrong, and the humility to ask for and receive forgiveness. Now, Ralph is going to tell you later what he did to seek forgiveness for the guilt that he felt, and also what he did to understand Raul instead of feeling ashamed of him. So let's talk about shame, because there is nothing that creates a soul injury faster than shame. And one of the most well-known researchers on the topic of shame is Dr. Brene Brown. Now, her extensive research on shame has provided this definition. The intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Now, Dr. Brown's research showed three things about shame. First, we all have it. It's universal. Secondly, Dr. Brown says that we're all afraid to talk about shame. And what's more, get this, the less we talk about shame, the more control it has over us. Now, unfortunately, many people, including counselors and coaches, don't practice this. They think we should never let shame sit at our table, so to speak. And if we bring it up, they try to talk us out of it. But researchers tell us differently. In other words, we need to prepare the table for shame's inclusion because we all have a shamer in our head. Better to bring him or her out in the open. And that means that we have to become curious about the part of ourself that's holding the shame. We have to abide shame's presence and change our relationship with the part of self that's holding it. Now, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the leading experts on trauma, puts it like this. He says, all parts of the self are welcome. We don't say to people, don't be ashamed. We say, let's go there. Let's explore shame. Let's feel shame. Let's see what this shame stuff's all about. So forgiveness liberates guilt. It does not alleviate shame. Extending self-compassion to all the scattered pieces of self, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, is what helps to heal shame. So let's turn back to Ralph again to see how he used forgiveness to liberate his guilt and how he used self-compassion to liberate his shame. 
In a moment, I'll tell you how I use guilt to heal what Raoul did. Right now, I want to talk about the spectrum of guilt. On one end is the person who doesn't feel guilty about anything, who doesn't accept responsibility for anything. We have names for them. We call them sociopaths. Do you want to be around people who don't feel guilty about anything they do? They th think their poop doesn't stink. They think they're not guilty for anything. It's always the other person's fault. They're unrealistic about accepting responsibility for anything. On the other end of the spectrum is the person who feels guilty about everything. If there's a problem in a relationship or something goes wrong in the household or at work, they feel guilty. It must be their fault. On this end of the spectrum, these people are called neurotic. They think that no one else's poop stinks, just their own. Their guilt often does not have a realistic basis. Let's look at a realistic approach. In his book, The Road Less Traveled, Scott Peck says this, what we are and what we are not responsible for in this life is one of the greatest problems of human existence. It is never completely solved. It requires continual assessment and reassessment. And isn't that so true? When you and I are having an argument, isn't it hard to sort of like step away and figure out how I'm contributing to the problem and how I'm not contributing to the problem? When I'm angry, I'm pretty sure the cause of the problem is you. But when I'm without confidence or if I'm a codependent, aren't I probably sure that it's my fault and it's hard to figure out how you are contributing to the problem? The serenity prayer encourages us to sort through this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In other words, Help me know what I am and what I'm not responsible for. Let me tell you how I did this. As I was preparing for this presentation, I became aware of all the excuses Ralphie used to hide Raoul. Excuses like, boys will be boys. And it had all happened so very long ago. Not to mention that I had become a really good son most of my adult life. But I realized that somewhere in the recesses of my soul, these childhood pranks lingered, and it was time I took responsibility. So the next time I visited my 98-year-old mother in her nursing home, I told her I was wrong to have committed the mischief that I did. I asked her to forgive Raoul for the turmoil he had put her through. She forgave Raoul easily enough, smiling and saying, we all make mistakes. I felt that liberating shift that Deborah talks about that dying veterans experience when they do their forgiveness work in hospice. Tears even came to my eyes, and that's when I realized that those tears were the river flowing from the log jam I had just removed as Ralphie and Raoul acknowledged each other without fear so we could be at peace with each other together. That day, I owned Raoul as part of me. I didn't need to be ashamed of him or make excuses for him. I just needed to help him take responsibility when he was guilty of doing bad things. So thank you, Ralph. Ralph is online and will be taking questions with us toward the end. Right now, I want to introduce you to Angie Snyder. She's the executive director of Opus Peace, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about guilt and shame and forgiveness. Thank you, Deborah. Now, you saw from Ralph's film clips that it's not his Navy experiences and it's not Vietnam that troubled him. The residue of guilt for him was from his childhood. And this point is important to remember because commonly we assume that military experience is the source of guilt or shame. And when we make that assumption, we miss other sources of guilt and shame that might be complicating peaceful dying. Now, 
Having said that, however, military guilt and shame can haunt veterans for a lifetime. And I recently had this experience myself. I sometimes work in an extended care facility. And one night I was helping Lester, one of the patients, to the bathroom when he sudden look, suddenly looked me straight in the eye and he said, I never killed anyone before I was 19. I paused and I anchored my heart and immediately I sat down on the floor, letting him know that I was ready and willing and able to hear whatever he was going to say. Lester began to recount his time in Vietnam and he said he often patrolled at night and he was shooting in the dark, but when the sun came up, he would be surrounded by dead bodies. And tearfully, he said, I killed men, women, and worst of all, children. And he went on to say that he thinks he killed hundreds of people, and he's worried that he's going to go to hell for this. So the next time that I was working on his unit, I brought Lester some Vietnam beads, and I pinned him on behalf of the Vietnam veterans, Marie and Jim Bainbridge. And he smiled from ear to ear when he received them, and he wears them now every day. So in return for Marie's gesture, he made me write her name down so that he could pray for her each night. And so he would practice saying her name out loud because he believes that prayer is more effective if you can make it personal by adding a person's name. Lester and I have heart-to-heart -heart talks whenever I work in the facility. And I've taught him how, the, how to do the anchoring heart so that he can stay connected to his body and so that he can feel those feelings of guilt, shame, helplessness, and loss. Now, we've also started to talk about forgiveness, specifically self-forgiveness. Now, he's open to the conversations, and I know I need to approach this slowly with him so that it's done on his terms when he's ready. So let's talk some more about forgiveness with veterans. Let me show you another film clip of Ralph talking about some of the research about forgiveness with veterans. And then Deborah will tell you how this research impacted her. Now let me tell you about some research that has been done with combat veterans who had unrealistic guilt about things they did or did not do. The research is required that rather than each of them accepting 100% of the responsibility, that they assign partial responsibility to everyone who contributed to the war. So they asked them, how much responsibility would you say that the U.S. government had for declaring war and sending in the troops? How much responsibility would you assign to the enemy government? And what about the lawmakers and the politicians and the general? who developed the plan of attack, and the squad leader that was leading your unit, and even civilians with their attitude of, hey, the war's over, get over it. Once these percentage of responsibility were added together and then subtracted from 100, the resultant percentage became the realistic guilt the veterans could assume. The researchers found that when the veterans' guilt became realistic, it became manageable. This research study had a big impact on you with some guilt you were carrying, didn't it, Deborah? It did, Ralph. Several years ago, my younger sister was diagnosed with a terminal cancer that I knew would take her life in just a few months. She was young. She had young children. And this was tragic for our whole family. She lived in Indiana. I lived in Florida. I would fly up to Indiana for two weeks, help to take care of her, go back home to Florida for a week, and this went on for six months like that. One day, I was getting ready to go to the airport to leave for Florida. I had my suitcase in one hand, my other hand on the doorknob, and she said, don't go. Thought about it for a moment. Then I gave her reassurance that I'd be back the next week. I had other people coming in to help in the interim. And I went on to the airport. Well, after I got home, three days later, I received a phone call saying that she had lost consciousness. I flew back up immediately, was at her side for the next three days as she was dying, and was at her side when she died. 
Now, by anyone's standards, including my own, I would have received an A-plus for my devotion to her. But it was that one mistake. That one time I did not listen to her. That one time I could have said yes that I held on to. And it lurked in the background. And I realized it was lurking there several years later when I heard about this research study that Ralph spoke about. And I decided to rethink the position that I had taken with myself. So I sorted it out. It is true that I did have control over saying yes or no. But it was not realistic for me to know that she would become unconscious in three days. So I became more realistic. Instead of feeling 110% responsible, I decided that I was 20% responsible for that decision that I made. And that 20% was more realistic for me to be able to forgive. I also recognized that my reality included how I also had responsibilities to tend with my own family and my own workplace. And in that moment, I allowed myself to feel my helplessness of not knowing what I did not know and could not know. In that moment, I released the irrational guilt I was using to numb that ugly feeling of helplessness because I could not change what was happening to her. So let's talk more about helplessness because it has a surprisingly relevant role in irrational guilt, a role that you probably never thought of. I call irrational guilt helplessness, and overly controlling behaviors, the mysterious triad. And one of our Opus Peace ambassadors, Stephanie Turner, is going to tell you how that relates to trauma. And she'll use the example of sexual trauma. Let's look a little more closely at the relationship between unrealistic guilt and helplessness that Deborah's talking about. What happens during trauma? We know that there is a sequence of events that occur. When someone is being raped, they feel utterly helpless. I know because a close family member molested me. Not once, but twice and I thought it was all my fault. I was 12 years old, and he had me sleep in the bed with him. And after the second time it happened, I vowed never to be in that bed again. The molestation stopped, and therefore I concluded it was my fault. So I didn't tell anyone for decades. It is only natural, just like I did that after a trauma in which we feel helpless, that we say to ourselves, I will never put myself in a position again to feel so vulnerable and helpless. And just like I did, a decision was made to control everything to prevent its reoccurrence. We know that traumatized people are often overly controlling people. They believe if they have all their ducks lined up in a row, that they wouldn't have situations like this happen again. Unrealistic guilt gives the illusion of controlling uncontrollable situations that they won't happen again. But it's just an illusion. And so for me, rather than letting myself feel how innocent and helpless I was, I made sure to always maintain control. The good things were, I never went into his bedroom again. I locked my door when I was at his house and I watched him for suspicious behavior. But what was not good is that I began to control other people and people I didn't need to control. And I was often suspicious of people that I didn't need to be. I was rarely vulnerable with others and I didn't trust anyone and I most almost always never trusted myself. And that's when it became unrealistic. 
So anytime you have irrational guilt, think helplessness. And what you want to do is to help people feel their helplessness when they are in uncontrollable situations so that they won't use irrational guilt as a numbing agent to cover up those feelings. Let me give you an example. Here's what one woman expressed in a letter to her mother. She thought the letter was about forgiveness, but she discovered that it was actually about childhood helplessness. Listen to what she writes. I forgive you for what you thought and said about me and the disgust that you showed when you said it. I forgive myself for living out the label. I forgive you for crawling into a bottle. I forgive myself for running away as soon as I could. I forgive you for drinking yourself to death. I forgive myself for leaving dad to deal with it all. I forgive myself for having no guilt. Sandy said that this poem liberated the irrational guilt that she had from the sense of responsibility of taking care of her mother. And for the first time, she let herself feel the helplessness that she had not let herself feel as a young child and teenager. All right, well, let's move now from fear of helplessness and loss of control to secondary wounding. This book, Visions of War, Dreams of Peace, was written by women who served in Vietnam and they used poetry and the arts to help recover from the wounds that they suffered. This particular poem reflects secondary wounding that we're gonna talk about in a moment. Listen to this. Do you really wanna know how you can help me? Then don't turn your back on me as if I was to blame. You share in this too. I did the dirty work, the least you can do is to listen to me. Do you hear the bitterness? This is an example of how silence and worse blame causes secondary wounding. And again, Stephanie, our Opus Peace Ambassador is going to tell you about that. Another thing that is unfair is secondary wounding. Let's talk about that for a moment. Secondary wounding occurs when people don't get the support that they need when they've been emotionally wounded. People who have been violated often report that secondary wounding is harder to forgive than the original assault itself. Think about it. Which is frequently reported to be harder to forgive? The molester or the parent who protected them? Yes, the protector is reported to be harder to forgive. How about the bully who taunted you or verbally assaulted you? Or the teacher who wouldn't stand up for you? The comrade who raped you? Or the commanding officer who looked the other way or demoted you for reporting it? And what about our Vietnam vets? They often say that it is harder to forgive the Americans who spat on them when they returned home than it was to forgive the North Vietnamese soldiers who were shooting at them. Now, why is this frequently reported that it is harder to forgive? Because of the lack of support from a trusted one, trusted people or organizations, there's this mixed ambiguous signals of, I love you, I care about you, but I am not gonna stick up for you. And this causes confusion and suspicion and it complicates the forgiveness process. And then what happens? You begin to think that you don't matter you begin to think that you're not worth it. And then as a result, you acquire a soul injury. The definition of secondary wounding 
is people's response to someone's trauma with disbelief, denial, minimization, stigmatization, or refusal of help. So you can see how secondary wounding is like pouring salt into a wound. So it's important that we don't try to minimize, ignore, or silence other people's experience of adverse events in their lives. And that we don't try to minimize or ignore our own adverse experiences. That's called secondary self-wounding. Let's turn our attention now to using forgiveness as a means to repair mistakes that we make, not only with veterans, but also with their families. At Opus Peace, we often talk about military families and how they are often unsung heroes that get overlooked or forgotten. In this next film clip, Deborah talks about the mistake that she made in overlooking a veteran caregiver's needs. Practice for more than 30 years. I'm guessing you've made your fair share of mistakes. I have. But one time I did damage that was not so easily repaired. I went to a unit to evaluate a patient for hospice services. And when I got there, the staff said to me, you know, his wife has already gone home for the day and she doesn't want you to see him unless she is present and she does not want you to tell him that you are with hospice. Well, I deal with these kinds of situations all the time. So I thought, well, I'll just go by and introduce myself to the patient and then I'll come back tomorrow when his wife is present. So I went in to see the patient. I did introduce myself as a hospice nurse practitioner because I think it's unethical to hide that. It did open up a wonderful discussion about dying that he initiated and he thanked me over and over again for coming. I leave his room patting myself on the back for what a good job I had done. I come back the next day to see him when I go in his room. There's his wife at bedside. She looks down, looks at my badge, sees who I am, and she goes like this out into the hallway. She follows me out in the hallway and she said, I left orders that you were not to see my husband unless I was present and you were not to tell him you were with hospice. And then she banished me essentially from his care. You know, I was just crestfallen. Well, a few days later, his condition worsens and he is indeed transferred to our hospice unit. Well, now my mistake needs to be public because I've got to explain to my team why I can't be involved in his care. A few days later, he dies. Now, I'm thinking this is gonna be the last time I'm going to be dealing with his wife, but it wasn't. So let me read to you the, our next encounter. A few months later, I saw Emily again this time at the hospital memorial service that we hold for families of patients who die at our hospital. She saw me too, and she glared from her fourth row seat in the auditorium. When I took the microphone to welcome people to the service, I could feel her piercing gaze. After a few opening remarks, I spoke about how we strive to serve and how we sometimes fail. I then looked directly at Emily and I said, Mrs. Mann, I know I made a mistake in not listening to your desires for your husband. I realized that my action increased the suffering you were already feeling. I just want you to know that I am very sorry for having done that to you. She hesitated for a moment, then she nodded her head and she uncrossed her arms, and I felt forgiven. So you can see how Deborah let guilt guide her into remorse, which allowed her to seek and ask for forgiveness. Unforgiven guilt didn't need to rob her of her sense of self. Now, as we bring this section to a close, I'd like to bring us full circle back to Linda Tragesser's story. Listen to what she says about how the soul injury concepts helped her heal the relationship she had with herself. Linda says this. 
the first time I heard the words insidious soul injury, they touched me in a place deep inside that I can't quite explain. I had never before heard the term, and yet I knew it. I lived it. It was easy for anyone listening to my story to quickly understand the trauma I had experienced. But no one, not even myself, recognized the insidious nature of the soul injury that occurred each day that I strived to be the responsible one, the one who made everyone's life easier. It was the insidious nature of my soul injury that had made it so deadly. It is only now after learning about soul injury that I realize how I how cut off I've been from my own inner sense of self. That little girl was not hurt by the trauma to her hand. She was hurt by assuming responsibility for everyone else's feelings. She was hurt by always putting on a brave front. Now I can look back and see all the significant decisions that I made that were based on making others happy, even though I knew they were not the right decisions for me. I didn't challenge this behavior until I perceived my inside as an empty hole. Although I recognized this black hole a long time ago, it has only been in the past couple of weeks when I took the soul injury inventory that I identified what I was dealing with, a soul injury. Now I want you to imagine how different Linda's life might have been if someone would have identified the potential for a soul injury when she was a child and had helped her deal with the subsequent issues of loss, guilt, shame, and helplessness so that it did not corrode her sense of self. Now we're getting ready to open it up for questions to Deborah, and we also have Ralph on the line who will be answering questions. So you can type your questions in the Q&A section or in the chat, and we will answer as many of those as we can Unfortunately, Stephanie had another commitment, so she wasn't able to join us for today's webinar. So while you're inputting your questions, we have one final thing that we wanna address. So each year, Opus Peace recognize, recognizes someone whose personal and professional life serves as a beacon for peace by advancing the soul injury movement. Nominees must exemplify three characteristics to qualify unswerving leadership, passionate advocacy, and humble service. These three criteria are needed to be change agents in the world. And we call this honor the Mead Team Award because the recipient must demonstrate what the famous anthropo anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. This year's award recipient has demonstrated these qualities and as a result has helped Opus Peace spread the message about soul injury to a wider audience. Opus Peace is proud to announce that this year's recipient is Louise Sutherland Hoyt. Louise is an army veteran who noted the work that Opus Peace had done with 10,000 dying veterans. She recognized her own suffering from guilt shame, and military sexual trauma. She identified how this had caused her to become separated from her own sense of self, causing a soul injury. She signed up for the Soul Injury Institute to begin her personal journey toward healing and inner peace. Subsequently, she wanted to be a part of the soul injury movement, becoming an intern at the Institute, teaching soul injury tools to her clients, becoming a member of the Opus Peace Research Council, and promoting the annual Opus Peace Public Service Anchor Your Heart event each year on February 2nd. She formed a social media group where she holds webinars and live events using Opus Peace materials to address a variety of topics. She also teaches fellow veterans about soul injury because she recognized how unmourned loss and hurt, unforgiven guilt and shame, 
and fear of helplessness and loss of control surfaced with the veterans seeking services. Just last month, while sitting in the emergency room for an injury she had received, she noted a veteran in distress. She immediately sprang into action and made her way over to the veteran. She offered to ease his distress by using the anchoring heart tool with him. He reluctantly agreed and she placed her hands and his hands over his heart, breathed deeply and help him, helped him to recognize and feel the place inside him that is strong enough to hold pain and peace together. Her husband watched in amazement as she put another veteran's needs above her own and she was able to decrease his anxiety and bring him a sense of calm. It is with great honor and respect that the Opus Peace Board of Directors announces that the 2023 recipient of the Opus Peace Mead Team Award is Louise Sutherland Hoyt. Louise, I believe Mr. Hoyt is near nearby and has an award to present to you. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Hoyt, are you nearby? Do you have something for me? An award? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, he says he just just now. Whoops. Well, hurry along. Well, Louise, feel free if you'd like to say anything while your mic is open. Well, thank you. Uh this is this is a something one of those amazingly positive, unexpected accolades that I will carry with greatest solemnity. This anchoring heart business is, I think, the calling card for Opus Peace. I believe in it. I believe in it for myself and for anyone that I come in contact. And if there's anything in this business of overcoming the fear of self-forgiveness, this is where you begin. Begins with me. It begins with you. Hands on heart. Forgiving. Mr. Hoy. I have a. Oh, we're waiting for Louise to open that. We'll just remind everybody that on February 2nd, 2024, mm -hmm. we will be holding National Anchor Your Heart Day. I hope you'll all want to be a part of that. Thank yeah, you. Louise, you can read what it says if you'd like. They can. It, it's clear, so it's hard to see on the camera. I know, but it, it's, so, it's so pretty. It says, unswerving leadership is evidenced by courageous honesty passionate advocacy, humble service, fueled by grace. Thank and you, Louise. Congratulations, Louise. <laughs> Many Thank thanks. You. Thank you. So at this time, we'll open it up to questions. So I don't know if there's anything in the chat or in the Q&A. Thanks, Angie, and congratulations again, Louise. Um, I didn't see anything, mostly uh, mostly a lot of comments of congratulations, and um, I thank you to the Opus Peace team for holding this webinar. Um, Tori, if there is anything that I missed, please let me know, or if anyone does have a question, you're welcome to type it in the chat box or raise your hand and we can put you off mute. Oh, and thank you, Tori, for putting the registration link for part two next week in the chat box. Do not forget to register for that. Yeah, I just wanna make the point about next week's webinar, which will be, it is part two. So part, what you learned today will not be repeated. It will be uh, separate. Mm -hmm. However, if you know people that were not here today, they can still come mm -hmm. next week because it is a standalone. It is independent. 
Secondly, even though you registered for today's webinar, next week's webinar, you still have to register for that one. They are separate. So we hope to see you again next week. It will be a very uh, different format and with a lot of different, uh, it'll focus much more on stories and application uh, of this. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Deborah. And I also wanted to share with attendees that Opus Peace has has graciously and generously offered a 20% discount on the forgiveness film or anything else on their website through the end of November for any attendees that are here today. So thank you, Tori. She entered the discount code in the chat box. It is veterans with a capital V20. Again, it's in the chat box. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Opus Peace team. We did have quite a few questions about the recording being available. Yes, so we have been recording this webinar. As always, it will be posted on the Opus Peace resource page on the We Honor Veterans webinar. Uh, the slides will not be posted with it, but know that they are in the video so you can follow along. Um, let's see. So that will be up again within the next few days to a week and you can watch that and share it with others who may have not been able to participate today. Um, so the, so the film, I was going to say, let me if I could just mention the film itself, the, the first part, if you purchase the film, uh, we'll outlay all the concepts uh, that myself and Ralph and Stephanie provide. All the slides are on that. And then part two is, I believe, like eight or 10 short video clips of other people talking about how they've applied it that you can then use. So it's going to be, we designed this to be a great educational tool uh, where you can um, not only see the concepts, but you can pull different pieces then in to make certain points, teaching points that you want to make. Uh, so it has some flexibility there for how you want to use it for yourself or for your, your uh, community or for in services uh, with your coworkers and helping people, you know, hospice, much of hospice work, you, you all know as well as I do how much unresolved and unfinished business surfaces at the end of life that has to do with um, regrets and forgiveness type issues. So this really is our um, contribution to trying to help all of us as bedside workers when these things come up oftentimes to be able to know how to successfully help people to navigate that path. Thank you. So Deborah, someone did say in the chat, they ask if the next presentation will be more emphasis on non-veterans and forgiveness, which I do believe you just answered that. Yeah, uh, we, we will include both. Um, we the, the context of these short little film clips that we have, the context is, is different. Uh, and again, like we, the point we made today, sometimes we assume that a veteran's issue is going to be military uh, and we shouldn't make that assumption because oftentimes it's not something uh, from the military that bothers them when they're in hospice. So this context that you'll hear about is definitely hospice oriented, but it's, what we've learned, the lessons that we've learned from traumatized people on their deathbeds is absolutely applicable to all of us in a very pervasive way and sometimes a surprising way. So there's also a question asking, what do you recommend as first steps to help folks dealing with soul injury? Well, first step is really to recognize what a soul injury is. <laughs> because um, it's kind of like an elephant in the middle of the room that is pervasive. We see it everywhere. As we said, anytime we get really disconnected from our own sense of self. So I think first step is to be able to recognize that that happens. And the second step is to identify those three causes, you know, um, you know, unmourned loss and hurt, unforgiven guilt and shame, and fear of helplessness and loss of control. I mean, the reason I call uh, the mysterious triad, the, the helplessness, the uh, loss of control and forgiveness is because people don't relate uh, um, unforgive or uh, irrational guilt with how that's a numbing agent for helplessness. And, you know, in our professions, we're taught to be helpful, to teach people to have control, to give them as much control as possible. 
And yet what happens when we come to hospice is what, what do people need to do? They need to come to peace with their loss of control because that's what dying is. You're losing control. You're losing independence. You're having to become more dependent on others. And, you know, for me, I worked uh, almost exclusively with veterans who had been trained to be strong and, in, and independent and to be the protectors of their family. And for them to let go of that, I mean, that was sometimes heartbreaking. But what helped them come to peace with that was to help them identify, yes, you are in a helpless situation. Tell me what that feels like for you. And they would often say that it pissed them off. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how angry it is to start losing control. Let's talk about how to release that. So, I mean, those elements I think are critical as far as being able to identify the three causes to be, and just offering that term soul injury. You saw it today when, uh, with Linda Tragesser's story, where she said, when I, I'd been living with this for decades, didn't have a name for it. But when I saw soul injury, there it was. I'd been living it all my life and I didn't even recognize what it was. So I don't know if Linda's on the line today or not. I did. I should have asked her to, to be on today. I'd let her speak. But at any rate, I hope that answers the question. But that, I mean, that's the first basic steps, uh, obviously. And of course, we have a lot of resources. I, I would encourage you to go on our uh, masterpiece. We have an online educational program uh, with a lot of different courses. And the first lesson of every course is free. So uh, I think you can, you know, people can go on there and that will acquaint you also with a lot of the causes and a lot of the concepts, um, as I said, th that are right there available to you. We are a nonprofit. We make all of our resources very affordable. If you compare, um, you know, what we have available, I think you'll see that, um, you know, we really want to get the message out there. Anything else? So we just showed you five short film clips today, but the uh, the part one film, I believe, is about an hour and 15 minutes, the, the full length. And as I said, it has all the slides in it. And then part two is the shorter clips where you can um, show all of them or parts of them or certain ones or whatever context you might want. Anything else? Well, the other thing we do hold a free public service event every February 2nd. And so I hope you'll um, be, that will be something you and your agency might want to join in. Those of you who are watching, I know NHPCO will be participating as well. But at three o'clock Eastern time on that day, uh, just imagine the whole people from throughout the, the world anchoring their heart, becoming fully present to themselves for just three minutes to pay attention to the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful that's inside them at that moment and being able to make peace with whatever they discover there at that moment. Um, it's quite powerful. Um, the hour prior to that, we will do a free webinar. It will be on self-compassioning. And um, again, I hope that you will, uh, that will be something that you'll want to participate, helping people to become fully present with themselves and to learn how to make peace with the good, the bad, the ugly, the scattered pieces of self that we all have within. Thank you, Deborah. We do have one question that came in through the Q&A. Um, and it was that you mentioned, um, it was 
20% of your decision to leave your sister and realistically appraising your responsibility to help her with self-forgiveness. What if someone wants to hold on to being responsible? Any ways to shift someone in this? Hmm. <laughs> that that's a great that's a great question. You know, it really I think the, the first step is being able to talk to someone um a trusted person that's not going to try to talk you out of being responsible right that's the first thing everybody wants to do oh you weren't responsible oh you couldn't know oh you know if you're feeling ashamed or guilty about something that's real it may not it may be irrational it may not be a fact that fits the facts it's still real it is still real so the first thing you want to be able to do is to talk to someone like Bessel van der Kolk this, would say, you know, don't try to hide it. Don't try to talk people out of it. Bring it to the table. Let's take a look at it. You know, bringing fresh air, bringing consciousness to something. As I said, it was several years where I had harbored this irrational guilt. And the, and the reason I assigned it 20%, which obviously is a bit arbitrary, but the reason I felt like, it was more than 0% was my sister was not one to ask me for anything. She always felt guilty about that. She was a, being a burden to me. She knew I was neglecting my family, my job. So for her to ask was significant. And that's why I felt like that I had ignored that when in fact it was a significant component of that. So that's why I held, I assigned the 20%. Um, but the rest, I couldn't have known she was going to die, you know, the next week, I couldn't have known these other things. And that's when I realized. So I would say, you know, the first step is being able to talk to a trusted person who's willing to explore it with you without trying to remove your guilt, without trying to talk you out and tell you, oh, you shouldn't feel ashamed, you know, to recognize we all feel ashamed of things. Shame is a natural part of the human condition. So don't try to pretend like it's not there. Don't try to cover it up. Um, and as you saw in the film, really what I discovered was just how help she was so young. She was at the height of her career. She was a physical therapist. You know, it was it, I felt helpless. Here I was a hospice nurse. Here I was an oncology, had been a, an oncology nurse for years before. I could do nothing to stop what was happening. So that awful, helpless feeling uh, was what the irrational guilt was covering up. And once I was able to allow myself to feel how helpless, because that was real, I was helpless to stop what was happening. So um, at any rate, that's how I would Answer. I hope that answers that intent of that question. Deborah? Yes, sir. Would you uh, maybe, to add to that, speak to the fact that it's the work of forgiveness. It's not just a matter of saying, I forgive you. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. We go over that a lot in the film, don't we? <laughs> Um, yeah, so many times people think that forgiveness, oh, you just need to just need to let it go. You know, letting go is the last step of the forgiveness process, but the work that it takes to get there is work. And oftentimes just letting it go is really just a code word for sweep it under the carpet. And then what happens then? People come to their deathbed at the very end and, you know, the conscious mind releases itself a little bit and this, these regrets surface then. So, um, yeah, it, I, I appreciate that, Ralph, that it is work uh, and there are several steps and it's not just as easy as, oh, just let it go. You just need to move on. You just need to get over it. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> it is work. And it takes uh, the more there, the more there is betrayal, the more trauma, uh, the harder that work is. I do see Gerard. You offered a comment, but I do see that your hand is raised. So, 
I just click the allow you to talk. Um, Hi, Gerard. Gerard, can you unmute yourself? While we're waiting, Ralph, why don't you say something? They got to see you on film. They haven't gotten to really hear you live and face to face. Or virtual, not face to face, virtual, live, <laughs> virtual. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I, first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to congratulate uh, Louise on uh, being the recipient of the Mead Award. And I want to thank everybody for being on the Zoom today. I, I hope it was very beneficial to them, and I hope they tune in again next week. And um, and I even hope that by the film and hold events with it where they can uh, help spread the word about forgiveness. So thank you for allowing me to be on the panel. Did Gerard get on? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Gerard here. Um, thank you, Deborah, for hosting and organizing this event. Um, it was through P Patricia McGuire that I, I, I came to know of your work. <laughs> Patricia and is co-founder of Opus Peace. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. She's a very special woman. She is indeed, and um, I had the privilege of uh, meeting her in um, Tampa, St. Pete, at one of the veterans' hospitals there. Yes. Um, but I, I, I really liked the ease with which you speak to the topic, because I find so many people rush in with you know, home cooked solutions like you just spoke of there. Oh, let it go, you know, let it go. And they're not listening to the heart of the person, the inner heart mm. that is just crying out to be heard, to to be embraced, to mm. be understood. And that's why I I put in there the need for reflection. It's not about talking all the time. It's about, for me, the, the beginning is presence and openness of presence mm. and uh, allowing the dynamic to build up of trust, listening, you know, appreciation, honesty, you know, uh, recognition of shame, recognition of responsibility. Uh, th that is hard work. So... Thank you for stimulating um, the reflective capacity of us this evening. You're so welcome, Gerard. I uh, so appreciate what you said. Uh, it really, what you're really saying is our job is to create a safe emotional environment where whatever is in within a veteran or their family member or whomever, um, that they feel free to come forth with it, whatever it is, and not try to convince them. Um, even trying to convince, I am. I mean, obviously we made this whole film on forgiveness. It's one of the components of soul injury. But we, you know, even for myself, I have to be very careful to not try to convince someone that they should forgive. Because when you do that, when I've done that, and I used to do that earlier in my career, uh, what you end up doing is adding another burden on them where they feel inadequate. Oh, why, why can't I forgive? Everybody else seems to be able to forgive this stuff. Why can't I? Why am I holding on? You know, they feel they can feel guilty that they can't forgive. So yes. it, it really is what you're saying is so important that we don't push people to forgive i always try to open the door and invite it i have to be very careful that i don't put forth my agenda which is 
I want you to forgive. I mean, secretly, honestly, when that is in my, I, I, I see how much peace happens when people do come to that place. And so I have this agenda where I, you know, kind of wanting you to forgive. And so I have to be very careful but that is not my business. I My business is to open the door. My business is to create a safe emotional environment. And my business is not to judge anyone for what they do or do not do. And I mean, you think about people, I know in the film, uh, Ralph actually talks about this in the film, where people, for example, in a domestic violence situation, Oh, they, you know, just take some flowers and a box of candy and, oh, I forgive. And they go right back in and they'll say, well, I'm just yes. such a forgiving person. Well, you know, you really, you know, that's not what you want to be doing in that situation and, and labeling yourself as, oh, I'm so forgiving. So I have to accept whatever comes my way. You know, that's where soul injuries happen is they don't have a sense of self to know that they should be able to um, protect themselves. Um, so to speak. So anyway, that's a whole nother, but that is explored. I will tell you that that is explored uh, in the film. We could only show you, I think we showed you five, three minute film clips, but um, we, we go into a lot of different contexts. Thank you. Thank you, George. I will tell Patricia that uh, uh, of you, and I appreciate that you must have been here in St. Petersburg at the VA where we work. Pat helped yes. me take care of those 10,000. She took care of the families of those 10,000 veterans while I was taking care of the veterans. So thank you. Angie, anything that you want to? No, I think you, I think you covered it. I answered a couple questions in the chat. Someone asked where they could find the inventory. It is on the main page of our website. There's also a free course on the soul injury inventory, which can be found at courses.opuspeace.org. Yeah, I think if you explore the website, you'll find lots of, lots of resources that can open doors for you. Um, and we would, we just love that you care uh, enough about this topic to join us today with your time, your energy. I mean, uh, I don't take that for granted one minute. I know how busy and how committed people are to other things. So truly, thank you. Thank you. All right, Catherine, I think that completes it as far as Opus Peace is concerned. If there's anything else you have. It does. I think we're done. Um, I just want to remind folks, as Deborah just mentioned, um, if you haven't explored the Opus Peace website yet, I would highly, highly encourage you to take some time, poke around, um, and do not forget to join us next Wednesday, same time. Similar place, uh, the registration link is on the We Honor Veterans events calendar. And again, Opus Peace will be graciously offering continuing education credits. So do not forget to register. And we're looking forward to seeing many of you next week. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.